episode of Quarantined Coaches. This time, we're at the University of Indianapolis with Coach Will Carroll. How are you today? I'm doing great. You know, it, it's, it's weird to hear people call me coach because it's not a role I'm used to. Uh, I know I'm different than most of the people on your show, but uh, I, I'm honored to be here, Josh. Thanks for having me. Well, I do want to get into some of the reasons you're different, but first tell me about a little bit about the University of Indianapolis, the school. Yeah, University of Indianapolis, we're uh, just south of downtown Indianapolis. Uh, you know, Indianapolis is one of the best sports towns around. I've been here for 20 years and it's just such a great sports town. Obviously, you get all the, the pro sports, the Colts, the Pacers, you've got the Indy 500, uh, but so much amateur sports. We, we've got the football national championship. We've got a great AAA team, the Indianapolis Indians, and in one of the best parks in all of minor league baseball, a Pittsburgh Pirates affiliate. So we get a lot of connection with them. Uh, but the University of Indianapolis itself is kind of the hidden gem. We're Division II. Uh, again, we're, we're just south of downtown, so you get kind of the best of both worlds. We've got great facilities. You can see uh, in this virtual uh, background behind me, uh, this is our, our baseball field, uh, which uh, you can see the dome back there. That was actually built for the Super Bowl a couple of years back when the Giants and the Patriots uh, played here. Uh, great game. That was the one where the, the helmet catch. Yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, they actually built that as uh, the Giants practice facility, and we got to keep it. There's a full football field inside of there. So uh, when it comes to baseball practice, uh, we've got not only the weight room, but three batting cages, pitching cages, a golf facility, an indoor track. Uh, we're on par with the facilities for pretty much anybody and better than a lot of Division I schools. So we're really excited about the things we're doing at the University of Indianapolis. We've been very competitive at baseball for a number of years. And the program under Coach Al Reddy, Trevor Ford, and Landon Hutchison is making big strides. We've got a great recruiting class coming in. And with this uh, crazy seniors thing, uh, we're going to bring back a lot of the players that were 12 and 3 at the time the season was canceled. You have an interesting background um, kind of in the doctor's office as well, or at least that's the perception of it. Um, your, your Twitter handle is at injury expert, correct? Yeah, um, yeah. Tell me about your. Will your was taken. Oh. <laughs> Tell me about your background as an arm care specialist. Yeah, you know, it, it's been a crazy career. I started out as a sports writer about 20 years ago uh, because no one else uh, was really writing about injuries in the way I wanted. Uh, I've got a background in sports medicine. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an athletic trainer. Uh, so let's be clear about that. Um, what I am is a guy who basically speaks doctor and speak sports fan and try to translate between the two. Uh, I've written a couple books uh, going all the way back to 2004 when I wrote uh, this book, uh, Saving the Pitcher. Oh, you got to put it in front of your face if you want to plug it. Uh, the background's picking it up. Yeah, background's killing it. Saving the Pitcher. Uh, I'm not plugging it. Uh, don't buy it. Don't buy it. <laughs> it's funny. People always say, oh, I got your book. And I'm like, don't, don't, don't buy that book. Because what we knew about pitching in 2004 and what we know about pitching in 2020 way, way different. Uh, it's kind of funny to go back and look and see what we thought was great. Uh, through that, I, I've had some great opportunities. I worked at ESPN, I worked at Sports Illustrated, uh, and most recently I worked at Modus. Now, a lot of the coaches out there will know about Modus. We uh, created the Modus sleeve, which measures uh, a lot of interesting things on the arm, including elbow stress. And then last year, I came here to the University of Indianapolis, who we've been working with, and Al, the head coach Al Reddy, said, hey, you know baseball, you're passionate about baseball, have you ever thought about coaching? And I was like, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, but he, he talked me into it, and, and I fell back in love with baseball. Uh, yeah, it, nice. it such a great group of kids, uh, such an opportunity to take what we know all the, the, the theoretical and scientific and mathematical models, uh, all the things that we think about and talk about and write about, we were actually going to put them into practice. And as I said, with the University of Indianapolis and the facilities, 
we've also got technological stuff. We've got Modus, we've got Rapsodo, we've got uh, just all the technological things, uh, including mathematical models uh, that were built for us to actually work us through the season. Uh, and we did, we started to use some of those things. It's not just the scouting and the defensive placement and the scouting reports and the hitting. Uh, we were doing some very, very innovative things with workload on the pitching side, uh, and they were working. So uh, we'll have to wait and see next year how that how that comes out. So I guess the next question would be, is we hear about, you know, back in the day, this guy threw two games in one day. In the old days, mm -hmm. he threw a doubleheader. He threw yeah, complete I'm games on back-to-back -back nights, you know. Um, now we're worried about a guy who throws more than 25 pitches in an inning. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you would think we're better off now than we used to be, but depending on the stories you listen to, it sounds like we're not. So where, where are we with yeah. all this stuff? It's a great question, Josh. I, I think the thing we have to realize is the game was different. If you just think back, I was watching the last dance last night, and, and one of the things that really caught my eye was that old Boston parquet floor. And somebody else on Twitter had this, and they're like, look at that floor. There's so many dead spots. They put that thing together. It was actually over the ice that was down in, in the old Boston Garden. And if somebody had a close-up of it, and there were scratches and, and dings, and it was just horrible. I mean, it looked good back in the day when we had, you know, a black and white TV that was this big. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea that Michael Jordan was playing on a floor in that condition is kind of crazy. But that's not that long ago. <laughs> Now, things have advanced really quickly. So when we talk about pitchers like Sandy Koufax, or we can even go back to Kerry Wood, who is that infamous pitcher that pitched both sides of a doubleheader in his high school tournament the weekend after he had been drafted by the Cubs. Yeah, he, he did that, but you see the cost. You know, uh, two Tommy John surgeries later, uh, Kerry had a nice career, but what could he have been? One of the things that always strikes me is, uh, here, I'll put you on the spot, Josh. Do you know the two players that have had Tommy John surgery that are in the Hall of Fame? Uh, John Schmaltz. That's one. Uh, no idea on the other one. Tommy John? The other, one, <laughs> the other one's the one that gets everybody. It's Paul Molitor. Everybody huh? forgets. That's why he moved from third base to DH. But when you think about the history of baseball, Tommy John surgery going all the way back to 74, only one guy has gotten into the Hall of Fame that's had it. Does it actually disqualify you? Now, let's, let's take this a step forward. Think of all the pitchers today. One third of them in the major leagues have had Tommy John surgery. How many are on track to be in the Hall of Fame that have had Tommy John surgery? My answer, absolutely zero. I, if you can find one, I mean, certainly you can talk about a uh, Justin Verlander, or Clayton Kershaw, a Max Scherzer. Again, all three of those have avoided Tommy John surgery. So health, obviously very key because for the, to be in the Hall of Fame, you have to be good for a long time. You can't just be good uh, unless you're Sandy Koufax good. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's no. going to be a lot of avenues for us to go down here and I want to make sure we're understanding. So I'm a high school kid. Uh, mm -hmm. I throw a bullpen one day. My arm is sore. That means I need yeah. Tommy John surgery, right? No. We'll get to that. Let, let me finish on, on the other. I got long-winded there. <laughs> okay. The thing is that those pitchers in old, you know, 40, 50 years ago did not throw as hard as guys throw now. Heck, I'll, again, all you have to do is think back 10, 15 years ago. You didn't have guys throwing 100 miles an hour. I mean, Lois Chapman was kind of the Roger Bannister there. When he did it, everybody else realized they could do it. Guys would go out there and, and – all the way back to Christy Matthewson wrote a book in 1906 called Pitching in a Pinch. And the thing he said was, throw very soft until you have to. So basically, he would just lob it up there. If you think back to when you and I were kids, uh, the shortstops were guys like Ozzy Smith, Dave Concepcion. Uh, you, know, you can go forward to Ray Ordonez. Could those guys actually play in today's game when shortstops are regularly hitting 20 home runs. The fact is, pitchers could take batters off. If Dave Concepcion was coming up, if Ossie Smith was coming up, uh, you could just kind of lob one in. What's the worst that's going to happen to you? Uh, if you remember Ozzie Smith's Go Crazy Folks home run, that was his only home run of that season. Uh, Tom Beaton-Fuehr had no idea he could even take the ball out of the park. 
So pitchers have changed what they're doing. The guys today are throwing as hard as they can, harder than they can in some cases, on each and every pitch. So what we're doing is we're sprinting a marathon, and that doesn't work out very well. So what we've seen is an uptick in injuries. We've seen those injuries get younger and younger. The biggest growth in Tommy John surgery is in 15 and 16 year olds. Uh, but with all we've done with it, we've probably shortened the slope, maybe flattened the curve is, is the proper term these days. Uh, but the, the injuries we're seeing are increasing at a lesser pace than we would expect because of all the arm care things, because of the knowledge we've gained, uh, unfortunately, the hard way. The Tommy John question, going back. Yeah. Uh, so my arm hurts, I need Tommy John surgery. Yeah, that's the thing that people don't understand. Tommy John surgery, I think it's first the name and second the success. Uh, when Frank Job first did it in, in 1974, he didn't do it again until 1978. Uh, and, and here's another great trivia question for you. The second pitcher to ever have Tommy John was Brent Strom, who's now the pitching coach with the Houston Astros. Great guy, one of the most knowledgeable pitching coaches out there. Uh, but Tommy John surgery is ulnar collateral reconstruction. Uh, it's the ligament in your elbow that basically holds things together when you're stretching it out, uh, extending it. When that particular ligament breaks or has significant damage, doctors argue about when you're supposed to do it, uh, but when that ligament breaks, you have to replace it. It's as simple as that. Uh, you, you take a tendon either from the arm or from the leg, you put it back through. It's essentially the same surgery that Frank Job did in 74 if you go and have it today. But it's a very specific thing. You do not need Tommy John surgery if your shoulder is sore. You don't need Tommy John surgery if your forearm is sore. You don't need Tommy John surgery if you uh, don't recover well. You need Tommy John surgery when your ulnar collateral ligament has failed. That's it, that's the list, and it doesn't make you better. When we replace uh, ACLs in the knee, it doesn't make people faster. When we repair an Achilles, it doesn't make you jump higher. You don't pitch faster when you get a Tommy, uh, a Tommy John replacement. It just doesn't happen. The data is there, and yet everybody I hear, uh, once a year I'll have a parent come up and say, hey, should my son just go ahead and have Tommy John surgery and get it out of the way? Who say, well, you know, should you have ACL surgery? Uh, because he's not fast enough? No, it's a very specific surgery for a very specific problem. So no, unless your only collateral ligament is damaged, you do not need Tommy John surgery. I mean, don't parents and players just panic these days though? I mean, like, they're always like, we got, we got to go to the doctor right away. Uh, because yeah. What's the difference between sore and hurt? And how do you know if something's really wrong? Yeah, you know, I actually like the fact that they panic a little bit because that means they trust the doctors. I wish that each and every school had a great athletic trainer uh, there. I wish they had some of the best doctors around. We've got great athletic trainers, don't get me wrong, uh, but these guys are overworked and underpaid to begin with. So for them to be able to keep up with, the, the, you know, we've got 20 something pitchers at the University of Indianapolis. For our athletic trainers to have their hands on each and every one each and every day, it's really difficult. So they have to focus their attention. I think what you have to do is figure out what your arm does. And in situations where things change, that's where you do have to start talking about it. Is this the soreness that I get the day after? How, keeping a diary is one of the best things we can do. Uh, our pitching coach, Landon Hutchison, uh, actually keeps a book uh, for each of the players of what we're supposed to do that day. How do they feel? Uh, we take uh, surveys each and every day about how does your arm feel, one to ten. And those kind of perception things are really good. But at the point where you do have a feeling in your arm that it's not good, absolutely get it checked out. Go and see your athletic trainer. In situations where something's significantly wrong, you absolutely have to go to the doctor. You have to go to a doctor you trust. And then you have to follow up on that. And you have to do the work. You have to do the rehab. You have to do the recovery. That's the part that I don't think people see. I think people panic and think, I can just get this fixed with some magic button, some magic pill. It doesn't exist. Tommy John surgery is not a magic uh, pill. It's a year of hard work after a you know, 30 minute surgery. Everybody wants the best 
training. Um, <clears throat> you know, you and I, I think we referred to him as the best practices for getting mm -hmm. better as a player. Um, that's not necessarily available, though, because it costs money to get lessons or to go to these fancy yeah. facilities out there things like that. So like how close to the best practices can the average high school baseball player get? Really close these days. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing, especially because colleges in the last, I would say 10 years, have gotten ahead of where the Major League Baseball pitchers and, and any pro pitcher has been. The innovation has happened with the college pitching coaches, a lot of whom you've had on this show. Uh, so it's one of those things where I think the, the type of training, the type of intent that we've had, the type of programs has really been available. It's not about having the best facilities. Look, it takes a ball, uh, a little bit of technology if you want to invest in that, and, and a lot of hard work. So I think when you see the ubiquity of programs like Alan Jager's Long Toss, uh, absolutely Anybody who can find an open field can go through one of his programs. Uh, you know, I, I, can't, I haven't seen a high school kid that doesn't lug around a set of driveline pile balls these days. Uh, again, it's not a zero cost, but you know, I've also seen kids that are, that are throwing water balloons uh, in, in kind of a, a, an adjustment to that. Uh, we've seen a whole lot of adjustments to those. And, and that's where I, I love seeing this is that you don't have to spend a lot of money. You, you just have to be a little bit innovative and you have to want it. But I think when you're talking about, you know, a, a modus sleeve at $150, that's within the reach of a lot of people. Heck, that's cost twice that. Um, those kind of programs are out there. They're available. One of the things that does bug me is I think there's a lot of great private coaches out there. I think there's a lot of great private facilities. The thing I don't like is that in so many cases, we're giving our kids over to these people with good intention, but are we always getting good results? When you pay your $100 an hour uh, to whatever coach is in your community, what are you getting for? Uh, I think parents need to take ownership of that and say, how am I gonna measure this? My kid is here now and I want him to be here now. Uh, what are we doing along the way? Whether you're using the best program or not, I want to know the best results because obviously there's a lot of programs out there for both pitchers and hitters. Which one's going to get results? I know in, in my bad baseball career, I dealt with a lot of coaches, some that connected with me, some that didn't, uh, some that worked real hard, uh, some that could just make one little tweak and it would change everything about what you were doing. Uh, I, I can, <laughs> uh, I tried for years to throw a curveball and just couldn't get the motion on it. And then you know, a coach goes, oh, just do this, and shifted the ball in my hand just a little bit. And all of a sudden, it was never a good curveball, but it was suddenly something I could throw for, for strikes. Uh, so it was one of those situations where you have to hear the coaches. You have to have the right opportunities. But I think we also have to put a lot more onus on the parents uh, and the players, to be honest. Uh, I think they should take ownership of this as well is measuring that kind of development. Uh, it's one of the things I do with my pitchers. How do we get you to where you want to be? And how do we measure it along the way to make sure you're on the right slope? What's the safe investment with, the, with you know, parents, families, time, money, you know, the resources they have? What's a safe investment to say, hey, you know, put your stuff, put your time and money here and you will get better? I, I think the easy solution for most people would be getting bigger and stronger. You know, the taller you get, the, the more likely you are to throw hard. So uh, investment in at some sort of weightlifting program, uh, whether that's with your school, whether you join a gym, just get bigger and stronger. Uh, make sure your legs are strong. It used to be we'd say, don't go out and, and uh, get bulky. I'm not saying get bulky. I'm saying get bigger. <laughs> you see some of these kids, uh, I, I won't name names, but uh, he knows who he is. We have a kid on our team who I told him, every time I see you, I want you holding a sandwich because he's got great stuff, but he's, you know, about six foot and weighs, you know, like he's this big around. I've got bats bigger around than his legs. If he got bigger and stronger, uh, he would be better. Uh, he works hard. He's going to get there. He's just a freshman. 
Uh, but it's one of those situations where I think that's the easiest one. Whether that's just carrying milk jugs around uh, the house a hundred times, as Bob Feller supposedly did, uh, or whether that's going out and doing a full squat program to get the, the kind of muscles that guys like Noah Syndergaard, maybe he's not the best example right now, having just had Tommy John surgery, but certainly strong, certainly throws hard, uh, and will again after this surgery. So I think the simple one is just getting bigger and stronger, eating well, sleeping well, uh, lifting weights and getting stronger. Well, I, think that kinda, that, I think that kind of answers my next question, which was gonna be like, what is, you know, <clears throat> what's kind of training that's universal that everybody should be doing regardless of size and age and weight, you know, because obviously those variables will change the way a guy trains, but what's like yeah. universal training look like? I don't think there is one universal program. It comes down to what you need to improve on. If, if you're a guy who's out there and you're a high school pitcher and you want to be a college pitcher or a pro pitcher, you know where you've got to get to. You know that if you're not throwing 90 miles an hour right now, you're probably not getting looked at. If you're at 86 to 88, you better be projectable. So you've got to think about getting stronger, making sure your arm path is good, making sure that you're efficient, making sure that you recover uh, between starts, between workouts. So I think the universals uh, are making sure that your arm's in the best possible shape. I think uh, long toss uh, and, and bullpens are universal, but doing them the right way. One of the biggest innovations we found at Modus was that we were throwing bullpens wrong, especially warm-up bullpens before a game, uh, because, you know, you got your catcher there, you throw the ball, you catch the ball, you throw the ball, you catch the ball, and it's not the same rhythm as in a game, um, you know, especially with pitch clocks. I think what you, we have to do is actually get to where we're simulating the game in the bullpen, that we take those pauses, that we reset, that we Maybe you have to close your eyes and imagine there's a hitter there. Or, here's an idea, actually put a hitter in there, uh, not swinging, uh, hopefully with an arm guard on in case you get a little wild in the bullpen. But I think we have to get these bullpens more like what we actually do in game. Uh, think about it. Every coach out there knows the feeling you get when a kid's been warming up and then he gets to the, the, the game mound and he suddenly can't find the strike zone. He looked good in the pen. What changed? Well, I'll tell you what changed, the mound and the lights and the crowd. Uh, we've got to figure out a way to make sure what they're doing in the pen is translating the mound. And I think that comes down to timing and intent and whether or not there's a hitter in there. So uh, I think those are universal. Long toss, I would say, should be part of universal. Man, it was years that I was against long, long toss, anything out to 180 feet or beyond. Uh, and, and talking with Alan Jager, uh, the most patient guy in the world, because it, it took him years uh, to chip me down and convince me that I was wrong, uh, but I was. I think those programs, I think what we have to do is take a look at how far can you safely throw it. Not every kid can go out to 300 feet, uh, but 120 feet, again, this is a Frank Job thing. Uh, it, the program only went out to 120 feet because not actually Frank Job. But, but uh, Dr. Curlin, his partner, who was the Dodgers team doctor in the 40s and 50s, the area they had only went out to 120 feet. So why does the program only go to 120 feet? Uh, because that's the area they had in Los Angeles. It's as simple as that. It's yeah. not super scientific, uh, and it certainly shouldn't be, uh, you know, what they did in 1954 in essentially what was a parking lot should not be guiding us today when you have a, a beautiful field like what you see behind me. Uh, yeah. We should be more scientific. So if, if you can go out to 180 feet and be safe and have the right kind of biomechanics, great. If you can go out to 350 feet, well, heck, even better, because that means you're throwing in, in the upper 90s uh, and you're gonna be a stud. So those are the ones I would think are universal. I would love to see uh, devices like Rapsodo and Modus be universal, but I realize not everybody has access to that. Um, weighted balls, what's the deal with those things? Yeah, you know, weighted balls, there's a ton of research on them, and I don't want to say they're good, I don't want to say they're bad. I want to say they're a tool. Uh, and, you know, a hammer works really good for knocking in a nail if you know how to use it. Uh, if you're using it backwards, not so good. If you smash it into your finger, not so good. I think weighted balls, 
uh, as a program are designed well. If you're using a driveline program, I've seen some other ones out there, those are well designed. What you have to do is know yourself as a pitcher or as a coach, you have to know your pitcher. Is he ready to pick up that ball? You have to make sure that his arm is in the right shape, that his body is ready for it, that he's not fatiguing himself or over torquing it. Uh, again, a great way to do that would be a modus sleeve. You can measure each and every one and our drive line owns modus. Uh, so uh, I think those two will be coming together. There's been some great research recently uh, on their Twitter feed about what they're doing, showing some of their workouts. So I do think that's uh, gonna be something that becomes more universal in the near term. But for weighted balls, as long as a pitcher is ready for it and does the, the proper term, I don't have a problem with it. Where we've seen the injuries is when you just toss it to a kid who's uh, a little weak, whose arm is tired. Uh, we see a lot of injuries both at the start of the spring or at the end of the fall when these guys are either not prepared or gassed. Uh, that's where we really see the injuries. How can a parent know if their child is ready for a weighted ball program? Uh, I would go to, to a coach who you trust. And again, that's a tough one because uh, you think you might, there are a lot of great coaches out there with good intent that really don't have them. So for me, I would go to a certified coach. Driveline is doing certifications. Rob Soto is doing certifications. I would go to a college uh, or high school that's had a lot of success and say, uh, where do you get this? Uh, but honestly, I think what it comes down to is can the kid handle it in both terms of strength and recovery? If you're going to move to a strength program, if you're going to move to, to uh, a weighted ball program, you have to get even more serious about recovery. And that's where I think the, the biggest gains can come uh, for uh, pretty much baseball in general. We've got the, the ramp up. We've got the strength thing down. Uh, recovery, we don't. Uh, that's where I think there's some asymmetric gains uh, where programs can get ahead of this, can be better than other places. Uh, let's face it, we're, we're all doing plyo care. We're all, most of us are doing long toss, uh, strength programs. We've all got a good weight room at the college level. Uh, the coaches, uh, I'm not going to say there's group thing, but 90% of us are on the same level. Uh, I don't want to pretend that uh, we're on the same level with, with some of the guys in Vanderbilt or, or Ohio State. But uh, I think we all have the same sort of knowledge base to work from if, if you take advantage of that. So I think we have to get uh, ahead on the recovery if you're going to get an advantage these days. And you know, I don't think many young players even understand what you mean by recovery right now. Exactly. Uh, high schools, families, like, what does he mean by recovery? I'm not injured. What do I need to recover from? So can you yeah. explain that? Absolutely. You know, a lot of people think recovery is rest. And, and you see this on a cycle. Um, and, and I'm actually against the cycle. <laughs> I'm absolutely against the idea that you pitch on day one, uh, you do nothing on day two, you, you throw a little bit on day three, you throw a bullpen on day four. Look, those are built on cycles that uh, they work for Major League Baseball, and I hate the five-man rotation, so I, I, I don't even think that works. Um, for you, you have to figure out what your cycle is. How do you get your arm back to 100%? What we do is kind of a waveform. Uh, you go out there and you pitch until you can't succeed. That's not muscle failure. A lot of people think we're going to 0%. That's not even close. Look, your last pitch wasn't 20 miles an hour. Your last pitch was probably three, four miles an hour down from what you normally pitch. We see that in the major leagues. If two to three miles per hour is where guys get pulled because the hitters are suddenly hitting it. Um, but you're actually activating more muscles. You're, you're creating more fatigue. What you have to do afterwards is get your arm back. Uh, you know, we, we've seen J-band routines. We've seen a lot of uh, routines. Ice, uh, you know, there, there's so much against it. I'm not against ice per se. If that works for you, go for it. But, it, you know, if it, you don't have to. I, I think you have to do what's right for you, whether that's uh, something complex like a Mark Pro or whether that's just getting your arm loose again. Uh, you know, you, you don't see Usain Bolt run a race and then just go sit in the stands. He cools down. So a cool down would be a great first step. Then you have to get your arm going. You have to make sure that it's recovering, that you're giving it the right nutrition, the right sleep, the right rest. Love meditation. Uh, there, there's a practice called yoga nidra. 
that I think is going to be an absolute game changer once pitchers get into it. Uh, it's not a physical yoga. It's a sleep yoga. Uh, and that sounds crazy. So I'll let everybody go out and Google that one. But I was talking to West Virginia the other day about um, their, their sleep analysis stuff that they're doing. And how that it's, they feel like they they feel like they were ahead of the curve on that, and they feel like that's one of the reasons they were able to turn the program around. Absolutely, absolutely. Sleep is so essential. If you just eat and sleep well, you're ahead of the game. And they seem so simple, uh, but <laughs> college kids uh, eat and sleep is not so simple. Uh, you know, they're eating junk, they're eating pizza. They're, I guess, some of them are drinking beer though. Uh, <laughs> no, no, not them. But but for high school kids, I think it's the, the same exact thing. Are you getting enough sleep? Uh, if you're not tracking that, and there are, you can go out and get an iPhone app that does it. Uh, the iWatch will be doing that fairly soon. Uh, but you should be doing that yourself. You know, it's tough sometimes to say, you know what? Instead of watching Westworld, I'm going to go to bed and get that extra hour of sleep. Um, I tell my my guys get naps. If you can steal a nap, go right ahead. If you happen to fall asleep in class, uh, tell the teacher, I said, you know, it's okay. I'm napping and recovering. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, it's one of those where it, it's just that simple, uh, but you can make it a little more complex. But you have to get your arm back to 100% before you get on the mound, no matter how that is. Uh, it, it's sleep and, and rest and uh, recovery. The other thing to keep in mind here, and this plays off what we were talking about earlier, if you're adding in other activities, first, you're going to be throwing. That's that's a no-brainer. But are you lifting weights? Are you doing another sport? Uh, what are you doing at home? That you know, if you're just doing chores around the house, that's uh, a tax on your arm and your entire system. So you've got to factor that into how do I rest and recover properly to get me back to 100 percent before the next time I'm on the mound. Are kids wasting too much ice at games after they come off the mound? I mean, they are building these transformer arms of yeah. ice is that necessary no no uh, you know what so what are they doing what yeah they're, they're looking cool uh you know if, if you remember uh nolan ryan but uh, i mean the trainers are doing this too they're like i gotta go to the trainer now they just dump yeah. them in a freaking like igloo and pull them out and wrap yeah. them up yeah if, if if an athletic trainer is out there i'm not going to question any athletic trainers if they believe that's the right thing to do for this kid the, it's going to get the inflammation out, then great, more power to them. There's no research that says ice is bad for you. Uh, you know, the guys from Mark Pro will tell you, you shouldn't be doing it. You should be uh, allowing the healing response. You shouldn't be forcing the healing response. Uh, but no, I'm not a big fan of 26 ice packs. Like you see, you, you remember Nolan Ryan, he would stick his arm down and basically a garbage can full of, of ice and water. Um, it, it, it's not really necessary unless you're, you, know, you use ice. When do you use ice? If you sprain your ankle, you ice it. You're trying to reduce inflammation. If you can look at a pitcher's arm and see inflammation, there's probably a bigger problem and ice probably isn't the answer. Again, is it the worst thing in the world? Am I going to tell an athletic trainer? I'm never going to tell an athletic trainer not to do something. They're the ones with the license, not me. Uh, but uh, it, it's a situation where it's not something I'm ever going to recommend. Yeah, it looks like the poor child has been in an awful car accident as soon yeah. as they're done. As soon as they're done pitching, I just always wondered is that really necessary? But I don't know. Yeah. My, about my favorite thing with ice is ice baths. There's a ton of research on that a simple shock ice bath uh, is better than you know a long term. Uh, the University of Alabama. There was a great study there. They were having all their football players after uh, they would basically strip on the field jump in the ice bath, sit there for 15 seconds, pop out, and then the next guy would come in. I was thinking, I wouldn't want to be the last guy in that line. Uh, <laughs> basically an ice bath of dirt and sweat. Uh, but it was uh, absolutely great. And their recovery was pretty darn good. And, and you certainly can't argue with their results on the football field. Yeah, they're okay. Um, so we know how technology is helping with skill development on the baseball field. How is technology helping with the health side of things, keeping kids healthier? Yeah, uh, you know, again, with a modus sleeve, it's directed towards that, understanding where somebody is, what their workload is. Uh, when you think about pitchers that are going out 
uh, just on an average day's practice. How many throws did you make? This is something that study after study has shown uh, the kids are bad at. <laughs> Even pro pitchers are pretty bad at. There's a study out of the University of Florida where they sent grad students to watch pitchers on the day of their games. Uh, Florida had just instituted a pitch count rule. I think it was 100 on game day, somewhere around there. Um, but they sent out grad students with a clicker. And every time that pitcher would, you know, for a warm-up pitch, for a long toss before the game, just playing catch with his friends before the game, they would click, 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 click. And that 100, they were finding pitchers that were 240, 270. There were a couple over 300. When you think about that workload, uh, that's not something we're good at estimating. How many throws did you make? Even if you script out uh, that you're going to throw this many pitches in the bullpen, uh, this many sliders, this many fastballs, you're, then you're going to throw uh, 12 rounds of long toss, and you're going to like, you're never going to get a really good count unless you've got somebody a standing over them with a clicker, which gets it, or whether you have them on a sleeve, uh, and you find out really quick that guys are throwing a whole lot more than you expected. Uh, so that's one. I think with Rapsodo, you can get a lot. I mean, even with a simple radar gun, uh, you, you pull your pocket radar out, uh, you start watching how a guy is throwing, whether he's dropping velocity, uh, whether there's consistent velocity. If you're throwing consistently, your velocity should be consistent on your pitches. If you watch the best pitchers in the world, uh, they'll change locations, but they won't change their mechanics. They'll change uh, speeds, but they won't change velocities. Uh, you know, they, you see guys, Zach Grinke's uh, the outlier here, but he can hit specific velocity. There's not very many pitchers that can do that. But if you watch guys, their fastballs at 95, 90, maybe 96, they'll muscle up to 97. Uh, they get tired and it's down to 94. Uh, their, their sliders at a certain speed, their changeups at a certain speed, and guys live in those areas. Uh, so if you've got a pitcher out there who's inconsistent on velocity, uh, then certainly that's problematic. And the radar gun can tell you that. This is evolving so quickly, right? Um, and yeah. as soon as you think that you have a beat on it is when the next thing comes out. Uh, and now you're trying to catch up there. So, you know, your, your best guess, what's the next frontier look like? Um, I think we're going to have a little bit more knowledge on the muscles. Uh, you know, th there have been a lot of talk about EMGs. There have been some some devices out there, especially for the lower body. Uh, Athos is a company. Uh, there's another one I'm blanking on uh, that, that makes some. That, they're really expensive at this point. You're talking about $1,500 for a unit, which is outside most people's budget. Um, but we're going to know how those muscles are firing. Um, used to be you would have to stick a needle in somebody. Uh, if you went down to ASMI in Birmingham, they would uh, you know, put the, the funny spandex suit with all the balls on you for motion capture. Uh, but it was the muscles. We still don't know uh, here in 2020 how the muscles fire or how the flexor uh, mass actually helps protect the elbow. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do. I think we're probably about five years away from having the kind of technology that's going to let us know exactly how the muscles are firing and where the fatigue is at that level. So I think that's the one that's going to come. I also think we're going to get a lot more uh, in terms of machine learning. It's not just the Astros that are using uh, supercomputers uh, out there. Uh, I think with both video and with the data, we're going to get machine learning and AI uh, that'll break things down and tell us quickly uh, when something's wrong, when someone's fatigued, uh, or even which picture to bring in. I think the Astros are fairly primitive, actually. They use a bat and, a, you know, a wood bat and a <laughs> plastic. That, that's how they transferred the information. It's that yeah. supercomputer in the back yeah. tied into the visual learning system uh, <laughs> that had 32 cameras. That's where I, I don't even think people realize how much they were doing uh, just on, on an IT side. Uh, it's pretty astounding. Uh, they were able to tell me, it. tell me, tell me more. What were they doing? When you say people don't realize just how much they're doing. Tell it me. wasn't just, look, all of us as coaches and, and fans uh, going all the way back, steal signs. That's part of the game. And I don't find anything wrong with it. Uh, I've got a player on my team, uh, and I, I will not tell you who, he is amazing at, at just finding the patterns. The coach is over there, giving the signs, doing the thing. 
And there was a game where we flat out had the signs in the second inning. And we won that game going away. Uh, did it help? Absolutely. You have to figure out how to transfer it uh, to, to the hitter uh, about what's coming. What the Astros did were they were using cameras. So if you get a better shot of all the guys who are giving signs, and it's easy to decoy, have signs, you know, maybe, maybe you got to wipe off, a uh, billion different things you can do. So if you know which one is giving the signs, that's one thing. You know, that gives you a better look. What they were doing is actually using computers to analyze it and using machine learning and artificial intelligence to break it down. A, comp a supercomputer in the back room can do it a whole lot faster than my backup outfielder can. Uh, and they were coming up with a whole series of patterns and it could do it time and time again. Uh, you can't beat a computer. It's like trying to beat a computer at chess. Maybe That's if you're Magnus Carlsen, I didn't know that. Not if you're Will Carroll. That's a whole other conversation that I need to dig into at some point. Um, but last question here, ton of information, ton of great stuff. People are going to have to replay this, I think, a couple times to process it all. But simply put, right, uh, what does the high school kid need to be focusing on to get himself to the next level, the high school pitcher? Get, yeah, get yourself healthy. That's the key. If you can take the ball every time your coach needs you to, and that's not just starters. If you're, if you're a reliever at this level, you need to be able to take the ball and know you can do it safely. So get your arm strong, get, get the recovery you need afterwards, and make sure you understand your arm. If you take ownership of that arm, just like you took ownership of a car, uh, you would take care of it. You would wax that thing. You would change the oil. Uh, you would keep it charged up. Uh, you would do everything you possibly can. Think of it as a possession rather than something that's just a part of you. Make sure you're taking care of it in each and every way possible. Again, strength, uh, I think mechanics are obviously a big deal, uh, but most people don't have, you know, that's why we have coaches out there to help make sure you're in the right place. And then recovery. Uh, it, it sounds oversimplified, but it's really not because most people aren't doing it. If you can do that and use the, what God-given talent you do have to the maximum, you're going to move on to the next level because so many people are going to fall by the wayside. It's the guys who can actually do it and succeed time and time again. It's the consistency. If you want to know the difference between a great pitcher and just an average pitcher, it's the one that's working consistently, not just on the mound, but each and every single day. I can see which guys are consistent. I would much rather have a guy who is consistent at 88 than an inconsistent 92. Those are the guys you dream on. But man, those are the guys who can drive you nuts too. Coach Carroll, great stuff. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, this, this blows me away. Uh, and I'm sure there's, there's a ton for kids to learn here. So thank you very much for joining us today. Hey, anytime. Next time we'll get into the, the opener and other patterns that uh, – We've been using the University of Indianapolis. I might need to get a more professional pitching guy to discuss that stuff, but uh, are we, I'm sorry. What did you say there? The opener? Yeah. What's that? Uh, we, we use an opener. Uh, rather than a starter in the first inning, we use a pitcher in the first inning uh, whose job is simply to go out there and get that first inning done. Uh, and then we bring in our, our starter or headliner in the second inning to get him deeper into the games. Oh, geez. Yeah, that is definitely, I had to take a double take there. I was like, wait a second, an opener. Okay, quickly before you go then, what's the purpose behind that? Uh, mostly it's to get the, our, our best pitchers deeper into games. Uh, you know, pitchers uh, can go, you know, six, seven innings at this level safely. Um, and so what we were trying to do is use an opener, get him in there to get through the first three, four batters, uh, get the other guy. And we were seeing that. Our, our best pitchers were going into the seventh, eighth inning sometime. Got a little bit greedy with the eighth one time. Um, but on the other hand, we were going to be able to use those uh, best pitchers midweek. If you think about most colleges that have you know, a Friday starter, a Saturday starter, and a Sunday starter, uh, and we had double headers a lot of times, we were going to be able to use those guys in the midweek. Uh, so think about using your Friday starter for two, three innings on a Wednesday, uh, we were going to be able to use those guys more often because we were managing their workload. In, uh, so we we're basically stealing an inning 
to get an inning midweek. Uh, it also, there were, there were some lineup issues. We had, we had uh, two great left-handers this year. Uh, so if you start a right-hander, uh, you know, he's opening the game in the first inning. Some coaches would uh, line it up. Uh, the other thing is we all know about the, the third time around of the lineup and the penalties you get the third and fourth time. That really didn't happen with our pitchers. Interesting. Huh. So in closer, instead of a closer, you have an opener maybe. And then you still might have a closer, but you kind of yeah. don't necessarily maybe need the middle relief. Uh, exactly. Break. Interesting. Well, again, Use Coach Cuff, thank you. Use your best pitchers oh, more often. Keep it going. Keep it going. Bench pitchers yeah. what? Use your best pitchers more often. It's a simple strategy, uh, but we've abandoned it in baseball. In, in the 50s and 60s, guys would regularly relieve uh, on the days they didn't pitch. Uh, again, that goes back to how were they able to do that? Because they did. Uh, instead of a bullpen day, uh, do that bullpen work on the mound. Love it. Great stuff, Coach. Thanks again, man, for joining us. This is super informative and, and very good information for everybody at any level. Thanks a lot, Josh. I really appreciate it.